Welcome to Plastic Model Mojo, a podcast dedicated to scale modeling, as well as the news and events around the hobby. Let's join Mike and Kentucky Dave as they strive to be informative, entertaining, and help you keep your modeling mojo alive. Dave, you better be rested up. We got a full episode this time. I know, man. We've been busy lately. Well, we've been to Canada and we brought a little Canada back with us uh, That's right. tonight. Evan, how you doing? Good. How are you guys? Uh, we're great. We wish we were at the show again, but <laughs> <laughs> or in the dojo afterward. Yeah, that was a lot of fun, man. Good seeing you in person, and uh, of course, the fun keeps rolling here as you come on a show again. On that note. Evan, what's up in your model sphere? Oh, just riding out the high from Heritage Con last weekend. That was that was just so much fun, and it's really just making me crave the upcoming national convention so much more. Man, nothing gets you motivated to get back to the bench and work on stuff like a, a big model show like that, and meeting everybody and seeing all the models on the table. That was awesome. Hey, Amen. Dave, what about you? Well, before I uh, talk about my model sphere, I want to do a correction. Uh, when we did the 12-minute uh, episode a, a couple of days ago, I said the contest in Indianapolis was on the 16th of April. It's actually the 15th of April. It's Saturday, not Sunday. It's those crazy Canadian Sunday shows that got <laughs> me got me confused. So I'm, I'm blaming Canada, as, as any red-blooded American sh- should. Uh, as far as my model sphere goes, I can't argue with Evan. There is nothing better for getting your blood up and your mojo vibing than going to a show, seeing a lot of great models that are all really inspirational. Uh, it just Heritage Con had the really nice uh, presentations put on by Evan and Chris Siebert, and both of them just just inspired me to get back to the bench and hit the ground running. My only problem is that I've reached critical mess. So before that happens, <laughs> there's there's a reckoning that has to take place. Just get a big garbage can with a bag, new bag. <laughs> yeah. And just I thought clean. all modelers just permanently operate on critical mess. That's how I do it. And th- you know what? Have you ever seen those guys who don't, who have the really crisp, clean bench and, you know, even while they're building, everything's in its place. And I hate those guys. I can't do it. I I waffle back and forth. I, I can't exist in critical mess forever, though, because you, you get in the groove, then you lose. You set a tool down, and you can't find it. Yes. <laughs> yep. So that's when I just stop, close up all the lids, and clean up. Yep. But Dave, that's not your model sphere. What is? I, like I said, I'm, I'm jazzed to get to building. I'm also jazzed for the nationals coming up. That's, I'm, rod, I'm riding a high. Uh, I am now on the downside. I've got a <laughs> my trip to Canada cost me three broken models, so uh, uh, I kind of feel like I have to get those fixed before I move on. But I've started to do that already, and uh, I've got some some free time coming up here. The wife and youngest child are going to be uh, away for a few days, and the oldest child is at spring break down at the beach. So. Starting about nine o'clock tomorrow morning, I am going to have the place all to myself. And shame on me if I don't get a lot of modeling accomplished during that time. You better push something across the finish line. Uh, well, I better do something. Well, yeah. So, what's your model sphere look like, Mike? Try not to have project creep on the bench. I'm trying to to not start something new, but I just uh, I'm going to fail. I'm going to fail miserably. <laughs> It's a wise man that accepts his fate. Well, if I if I if I go bad, I'm going to go big. I mean, I'm not just going to start one. I might start two. Oh man! <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we've got the uh, we got ourselves flypapered into the into the Model Geeks uh, Navy Mig Killers thing. Yep. So we're looking at that, and then I brought a kit back from Heritage Con that I bought it as a curiosity to see if it could improve another project, which I'll talk about this later. Uh, during the what broke my wallet segment, but uh, 
uh, stuff in those in the kit was lining up with the other kit I would was going to bash it with a little better than I'd anticipated. So that looks like that might get a green light. Sounds like you've got some inspiration going too from our recent trip to the Great White North. I, I do, but I was so tired and so busy outside of uh, the hobby that uh, I didn't get much done last week till the till this weekend. Yeah, no, I'm in the same shape. It, like I said, it, you know, I'm not 30 years old anymore. Less. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, <laughs> so, you know, these those. 19 hour round trips in 48 hours is just I used to be able to do that as a younger man I'm not sure that that's 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 not me at the at my advanced age you know Evan you just got to tear out of there and go do a bunch of other fun stuff maybe I should do, do this after that's but take a couple of days of work after the convention just so I can build models immediately when I come home because that's <laughs> what you want to do but you got to go back to work and it sucks yeah, yeah. It's just yep. it's a crappy time of year to take vacation, though. Yeah. yeah. Not That's more than a day or so, unless you're going you're, way south. You're saying the weather wasn't nice? <laughs> yeah, no. It was windy, it was windy <laughs> that Saturday but or Sunday, but it was – no, it was pretty nice that day, actually. Yeah, it wasn't bad. Sunday wasn't bad. Saturday was an abomination. That was shorts weather. Come on. <laughs> Where were your shorts? <laughs> <laughs> Canadian shorts weather, maybe. So, uh, gentlemen, I'm assuming that since we're recording an episode that uh, we have modeling fluids in front of us. Indeed. Let's start with Evan. Evan, what modeling fluid do you have? I have got Omnipolo by Zodiac. This is a strong beer, 6.2% ABV. And my boss at work recommended this to me. Um, so if you're listening, Richard, which I highly doubt you are, uh, I, I'll see if I like it. It's supposed to be a good beer and with a nice uh, citrus aftertaste, he said. Uh, I don't know. I'm always willing to try new things once, so we'll give this a shot. Good. Mike, what are you drinking? Uh, Dave, I treated myself to another bottle of Old Forester 1920. Ooh, good choice. Good choice. Yeah, um, i got to watch it, though. It's... A little high on the proof, but yes, it, that that will smack you in the face like a two by four if you're what, not careful. What do you got? Well, uh, actually, while we were in Canada, we had several listeners approach and provide us with uh, modeling fluids to sample. So, ooh, a bottle. Yes, indeed, it is a bottle of Upper Canada Dark Ale, and I don't remember who gave this to us. So if you're listening to this episode, please send me an email or a DM, and I'll I'll remember to mention it next time. See, we failed, Dave. I know. We were going to take notes. <laughs> we keep saying that every time. This is a, a dark ale. It's uh, 5% alcohol by volume, and it's Upper Canada Brewing Company in Guelph, Ontario, Canada. <laughs> uh, uh, first first sip is good so we'll see how how it goes for the rest of the episode all right sure. well the mailbag is is pretty packed good there's some good stuff here so let's let's get rolling on the mailbag dave you got it evan as usual if you got a comment chime in all right you're, you're in the third chair use it first up is david waples and i think dave is from uh the Denver area, because he's a member of the uh, Mile High Model Ship Makers or Model Ship Club. Yeah. And this is a twofer because he wrote in, and then before I could respond, he wrote, he wrote in again. Um, <laughs> he was asking me if I was following what was going on at Shapeways. Now, Shapeways is one of the early commercial 3D print to order kind of places. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people have a love-hate with Shapeways, but we'll get to that in a second. He asked me if, if they were, if I was familiar with uh, either the resins or, well, they were offering a new material. So typically they've had two materials. If you go into their marketplace for like scale model stuff, there was a couple different materials. Mm -hmm. uh, and the new ones are this uh, Visit M23 Gray or Clear Resin. And uh, he wanted to know if I was familiar with those. And uh, it was printing at a 32 micron layer height. And he ordered a couple of items uh, just to check it out. And... Unfortunately, 
He wrote me back a few days later. <laughs> I have a yawn to share with you. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> he took one for the team. He took one for the team. He ordered a 35th scale PT boat helm. It was actually designed by a friend of his. And the part arrived, and he sent me this picture of the part. And I'm like, yeah, it looks like it's carved out of wax. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dave, I'm sorry. If you get your buddy there to send you an STL file, I might help you out because I think I can do better than that. And and to add insult to injury, he says uh, a part was broken off and not even in the bubble wrap when they shipped. And I, man, that's <laughs> that's what happened to me. I ordered those. Uh, God, what were they? There were thirty. I actually had the maker create a thirty fifth scale version. It's it it's Japanese twenty or twenty five millimeter. The deck the, side ammunition right, the, the locker. 20, oh, yeah. 25 for triple, 25. Yeah, for the triple yeah. and well, a single, double, triple. Yeah. They, they had like three versions of that gun. But anyway, those things had these big wing nuts to lock the air, the watertight lids on them and stuff. And half those were missing when I got them. And, and then when I sent them an email asking, hey, what's up with this crap? You know, no <laughs> reply. So Shapeways was a great idea and it was wonderful in the, or, I mean, it was at least something when there was nothing else out there, but technology has just flown by them. Yeah, I think nowadays it's probably just better to go for a home printer. I mean, back when Shapeways first started going onto my radar was before that. The, before there were a lot of these good, uh, decent, even 2K home printers. Like all the 4K and 8K stuff now is amazing. But I ordered a few things like the... Uh, uh, German tool clamps 3D printed and some Stug Fender supports. And they look okay. They're like a solid B minus, better than the molded on plastic blobs, but they're even they weren't great. And nowadays what you could print at home is just way better than that. Well it's it's it sucks because I I know David will will David Waples will will know the, the name I'm talking about. There's a there's a there's a maker on Shapeways his his handle's D Stefan. And he makes all this Navy stuff in all scales. And he's got 72nd scale stuff, which I'm really interested in. But a better, I swear, a better business model for this guy would be to sell STL files at this point. Because the crap from Shapeway, and it, a lot of it is crap, unfortunately, and it's expensive. Yeah. Yes. And it's just not very good. It's yeah. even more expensive to ship that to Canada. It's probably three times the cost. Uh, I wish yeah. if they had a good quality printing set up. It would probably be okay to order stuff from there versus print it at your own home if you don't have a printer. Like, there's what that Zavod 3D guy has got a full 1942 Stalingrad STZ upper series you can you can get printed from Shapeways, but it's probably going to look like dog crap when it arrives. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, I would yeah. buy it if it was going to be printed well. Yep, that's true. So, Dave, I'm sorry. Uh, again, if you can get an STL file. Let me know. Or maybe it's time for you to get a printer. I don't know. <laughs> a lot of people are getting them. Yeah, I know. Best thing to have is not a 3D printer, but yeah. a really good friend who has a 3D <laughs> yeah, printer. It's like a pickup truck. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Next up's Paul Budzik. Not not familiar with that name. Yeah, right. <laughs> Evan might not be. He should be. Yeah, well, he is. <laughs> Paul sent us a, a nice email in response to Eric Simmelmayer's question about breaking off small parts last time, and he's talking about his B-17. Mm-hmm. Uh, Paul forwarded uh, basically the – it was his Fine Scale Modeler ar article from December 1989. Paul converted monograms – was it B-17G? Yep. To an F. Yep. Which had the you know, the pug nose kind of thing, right? The glass, the all glass nose, glass nose, and really, I think what he sensed the the article plus it had a, you know a lot of stuff that maybe FSM cut out, maybe yeah, uh, and just a lot more detail. Um, I, wow, I was twenty one when that article came out. <laughs> I was negative nine. <laughs> <laughs> you were a zygote. I was negative eleven. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, you know, what? We'll have to put that article in the show notes and uh, I'll forward it on to Eric and Paul. Thank you for that. And Paul, from the last time we chatted, uh, I haven't forgot about you. I'm looking at the schedule and uh, seeing what we can come up with because he'd like to have you on the show. Hey, absolutely. Uh, next up, Jeff Stuckey and Jeff's from uh, Birmingham, Alabama. And he is uh, in the front end of creating a 
a modeling jig uh, oriented for model armor modelers. Yep. Now there's that octopus jig for armor modelers. That's kind of hard to get. I think it's from Israel or Lebanon or somewhere like that. And, and you got to drill a hole in the bottom of your model to mount it to it. Right. So anyway, he, he's got something new um, that he's working on. He's going to hope to market in the near future. And there's going to be a Kickstarter campaign for this. I need to talk to him a little bit more, but uh, he's interested in, in launching this and uh, having us help him do it to some degree. And uh, we're certainly open to that, but we'd like to see what he's got going on. And uh, we'll, we'll keep fo- folks posted on the Kickstarter and uh, see where this goes, because, you know, I, I, I've got this car- crazy kind of it's not a pan of ice it's like an old crappy plastic rip off of a pan of ice but um i created a blocked amount of tank too but i had to drill a hole in the bottom of it and it'd be really nice to do something a little different and not have to drill that hole or you know because i had to take a nut off and unbolt yeah. it to get it to get it off and this thing he's working on uses magnets and uh, magnets is a good idea yeah i think it's a good idea so hopefully uh, that brings up subject uh Kickstarter really has become a way for a lot of idea people to get ideas into prototype and into production. And I can certainly see that as a viable way for folks with hobby ideas to get their either jig or new airbrush or whatever, you know, paint booth, whatever it is. That's that is an interesting path to getting an idea off the ground that might otherwise be a little bit difficult to get off the ground. Oh, you like the next two, Dave? All right. First is uh, Charles Rice from Barnwell, South Carolina. He's attended his first ever model contest, BeachCon at Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. It was on March twenty fifth. Great place. And uh, it was it was a uh, dual hosted show. The Grand Strand, which is Myrtle Beach, and the Coastal Carolina Modelers put on uh, this show, and he brought some models, and uh, his wallet came back lighter, ended up taking a third place in dioramas, so he had a good time for his first show. That's great. And he says, Dave, you thought peanut butter whiskey was bad? Yep. You need to try Rebel Yell Root Beer Whiskey. (laughs) Now, I've mentioned before that my father... His his tradition every night when he came home from work was had a highball with a shot of Rebel Yell whiskey. So I know what Rebel Yell whiskey is. Rebel Yell's actually not a bad whiskey or bourbon, but Rebel Yell root beer. Okay, I'm going to have to look for that. And if if I find it, I may actually get it. It's not going to be very much. But we'll see. <laughs> It's not going to be very much. <laughs> well, okay. Yes, it is not Buffalo Trace. You, no, you could get the big jug with the thumb ring on it, and it still won't be very much. <laughs> That's how good that stuff is. <laughs> well, along that same vein, uh, Ray LeGrant from Ware, Mich- or Ware Massachusetts, uh, he also attended his first IPMS show. This is with- fantastic. I've been telling people, go to shows. You don't know what you're missing. Well, his intent was not to bring anything and just go look at the stuff. But uh, his nephew, who's a modeler, and his son, who's a modeler, was well, nephew talked him into bringing some stuff and uh, said the worst that could happen is you come all you come home is with is your your kits. Yep. Which is assuming you didn't buy anything either. Right. That's true. <laughs> which is rare. And assuming <laughs> that you didn't break them in transit, but we won't talk about that. <laughs> you can talk about that later. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, even if your models, you don't think they're going to win, you might as well just bring them. They might inspire someone else to. Absolutely. To build that model or to, they might show a cool paint scheme or something to somebody else. There's plenty of inspiration on the table, even if it's not going to be something that's going to be on the front page of the next big weathering book or something, right? That's yep. right. Absolutely. There's only so much of those to go around anyway. So mm-hmm. bring it, participate. It's always a good thing. Well, he he got two bronzes out of it after thinking he wouldn't he wasn't up to snuff to even bring them. So, well, See, congratulations! You, you, you just never know. And P.S. the camaraderie of being with fellow modelers was great. So, that's what I'm telling you guys. Listen to me. I know what I'm talking about. And that lawyer thing scares him off, Dave. Yeah, that's right. Tim Holland. Now he's from Maryland. Pax River crowd. Yep. Uh 
but we won't hold that against him. He was following up on his uh, G8N build. What's that? That's a... Uh, the uh, Rita. The Rita, that's right. Tim, I'll go ahead and say this now. Good to hear you on the Model Geeks and uh, while DRAM was up partying with us in uh, Ontario. That's right. That's why he was on the show. He was on the Model Geeks. He was talking about this. I guess he's doing yeah. it. It's, it's orange because it's a test plane. Yes, the prototype. Anyway, he was following up because I think, is this the one he sanded all the canopy framing off? Framing of? off, yes. So Dead Design Models has a G8 in canopy mask. Yes, they do. And he says uh, Kit Masks also has one as well. And they're in North America, so that was all right. But I think he got the Dead Designs one. Yeah, Dead Design but, does a lot of great Japanese stuff. Well, anyway, he's using photographs online to, to determine the alignment and location of the mask. That does not sound like fun. No, it does not. But by the way, if you've got to sand all the framing off, that is a solution for redoing the framing. Evan, you going to do this someday? You know, clear parts and filling <laughs> seams are the two things that scare me most in this hobby. <laughs> and that's why I don't do aircraft yet. But as I've said before. You, you fill seams from time to time. I mean, you yeah. recreate a weld seam. Yes, but I don't have to fill a seam on a fuselage and then to rescribe the panel lines and the rivets and everything. Yeah. That that scares the crap out of me. And that's why when I build an aircraft, it will be one that <laughs> has good fit and comes with a nice set of masks for the canopy. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. There are a lot of those out there. Because I want it to be a fun project so it doesn't scare me off my first aircraft build. There you go. Well, Tim's trying to get this done for his... Uh... The Nova, I guess it's Northern Virginia Model Classic, I, I would imagine. Yep. On April 15th. Yep. And he sent a picture. I'll send it to you, Dave. It's uh, He's got the second coat of orange-yellow on it. And that is a tough color to reproduce. Well, listen to the geeks. He talks about that a little bit. Father Deacon uh, Raphael Shelton. He's from Oak Ridge, Tennessee. Uh, he picked up some... Uh, well, let me back up. He gives some comments or compliments actually on our uh, improved audio production for the from our, our new platform we're using well good and he likes the bes bespoke uh, transition music as well <laughs> thank you ed yeah i'll tell ed that uh, that that went noticed well he bought some uh, 1 to 144 scale kits from uh, anagrad and got a steal of a deal so he's got a a horton uh, 18 mhm mm that's the america bomber right Yep. Yeah. Uh, and some other little 46 stuff and uh, his first resin. So he's excited to dig into it. <laughs> and I don't know if he means all of them or just the, the Horton 18. Uh, the clear parts weren't in the box. That's not good. No, it's not. He's reached out to Anagrad. Hasn't got a response back, but he, he said in this scale, he could, he could sculpt opaque canopies and, and it, it might not be a showstopper. Yeah. Uh, but that's the last resort. Any suggestions? Well, if he's got the if he's got the chops to sculpt a canopy, he could certainly uh, draw form mold one out yes. of heated sheet styrene. Yep, that wouldn't be too bad. A plunge mold uh, uh, out of sheet styrene. I don't think because those Anagrad resin kits are kind of esoteric and unique. I don't think there's anybody that makes a vacuum form replacement. Um, but Hopefully, Anagrad will come through. They're a they're a large enough company, I think, that he may have some luck. And there are a couple of guys, a couple of uh, distributors in the U.S. that carry their stuff. And it's possible if you don't get a response from them, if you reach out through one of the distributors, they may be able to get you some help. Yep, that's true. I got a staff. I've been on their website a couple of times and that's just not a good place to hang out because <laughs> they've got some really crazy, even in 72nd scale. Yes. Like they've got a kit of that uh, experimental tilt wing that was built yeah. in the uh, late fifties, early sixties, I think. Yep. And uh, there was a, there's a photograph of that kit and one of the first airplane books my parents ever bought me when I was a, a wee thing. And uh, <laughs> that thing was in there. Yeah, so, stay off that page or you're going to end up with one. End up with some resin kits, resin aircraft kits even. There you go. Not a good look. And 
finally, from the email side of things, Dave, Mr. Michael Karnalka from New York City. All right. Mojovian Special Agent 004. We finally sorted that out. He's 004. Four. All right. Ah, oh, we What's can all cr- we can all participate on this one. Have we ever gone down a modeling tangent due to a TV show? For example, the recent Top Gun film most likely raised interest in the F-18 Super Hornet and the F-14 Tomcat. Sometimes a sci-fi hit movie attempts, attempts modelers uh, for something you might not normally consider building. And uh, that's about it. What do you guys think? I will tell you that the original Top Gun uh, it was the thing that probably inspired me to do my first A-4 aggressor. Yeah, that the actual flight, a lot of that movie isn't great, but the flight scenes in that movie are really, really well done. And it inspired me to build a Fujimi A4E in the aggressor markings uh, in the Colonel Toon scheme. Yeah. Evan, you got anything? I would think that I probably got as focused on armor modeling as I did because I remember when I was probably about 13 years old or so, back when the History Channel still had history stuff on it. So about four or five years ago. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> this is 10 years ago. Okay. The History Channel had a show called Greatest Tank Battles, which is actually still a pretty decent show. You can find it all on YouTube pirated there now. Um, yeah. But I remember watching an episode, and that's the first time I'd ever seen the Sturmgeschütz. And... I thought that looked very cool. And I think recently I had picked up a military model of a, the Tamiya Panzer II F slash G, the one that everyone starts with, the kit from the 70s. I picked it up at the War Museum and I enjoyed that kit. I was more into model railroading at the time, so I had some experience gluing little houses together. Um, but seeing that Storm shoots, I thought that's a cool looking vehicle. And then I went to the hobby store and I picked up the Dragon Smart Kit of the <laughs> of the Dragon Stoke 3G which is a not a not a good kit for your second choice not a smart kit <laughs> but I plowed through that and that kind of I actually enjoyed it and uh, got me more focused on building armor models and I still love the Stoker shirts today it just has some look about it that catches my eye the sleek low profile and that episode of the TV show I guess introduced me to that sent you down the path how about you Mike well, I'm going to go the sci-fi bent here. Um, S- Star Wars, given my age and, and when I was in grade school, you know, I, 1977, summer of 77, yeah. uh, dad took us to that. I, I remember it like it was yesterday. Um, all the Star Wars toys. I tried to build some of the crappy NPC first Star Wars kits in the late 70s that came out. They weren't very good. You know, the, the follow on of the franchise, the, the IP keeps keeps rolling out and, and some of some of it's good. Some of it's not very good. But uh, one of the franchise movies that came out was was Rogue One, which yep. is set right at where A New Hope starts. Really? Right. Yep. And of of all the the new stuff that is made after the the, the prequels, the episodes one, two and three, it's, in my opinion, hands down the best best thing they've done uh it I really is the like, only good one i would I, say I, I like that movie a lot and uh it, it's gotten me all back into it and and i saw under the amt label i think who is that round two i think so is doing a 30 second scale tie fighter I, I intend to buy and and to be honest um i don't know if you remember there was a guy on that it's, it's the diorama mag the diorama magazine you know yeah uh, had that Hoth post Hoth battle scene with the crash snow speeder and all the snow troopers holding the rebel flag and the, yep. yeah uh, on the front cover. Well, that guy sells STL files on Etsy, and uh, I bought a little diorama set from that's from Rogue One. Rogue One is when Darth Vader's going down the corridor rampage and all the the uh, the uh, rebel fleet troopers, and uh, I've, I've got that that I want to do sometime. But yeah, that's the that's the kind of rabbit holes I go down. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, there's there there is no question that movies and TV can be inspirational as far as modeling goes. Well, that's all on the email side, Dave. You got anything from the 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 messenger side? Well, yeah, I got a, a fair amount because uh, we ran in. Well, the several folks reached out to us to basically say how much they enjoyed meeting us in person at the Heritage Con show. Sver Odegaard reached out because in the last episode, I 
at the end gave a plea for photos of World War II era uh, Norwegian kilometer markers. I take it by his name is probably Norwegian, uh, but he reached out and then sent me an email with some photos, and I need to follow up on that because uh, uh, it's still a subject I'm kind of interested in now that uh, uh, you did that Russian kilometer marker, and uh, it was very kind of him. I, we've got the greatest group of listeners, and and that was just one example of it. We had a conversation with John Chung, our upcoming episode 88 guest. It was nice to be able to communicate through that. And then Ed Barrett had followed up with us because, uh, you know, he was our guest in the previous episode and reached out just to thank us and asked how how it had gone. And Ed's your classic engineer. He's always looking for feedback and ways to get better. It just it's it's that classic engineer mentality. And so he reached out. Um, it was really nice. We've had a lot of good communication. And in addition, we had a bunch of folks. I, again, we were bad at it. We need to, to do a better job tracking people who come up to us at the shows. We had a bunch of them at Heritage Con, and it was so nice to meet all of them. So, you know, that's it on the DMs. But uh, I, I really do want to thank anybody who came up to us at the show. And I enjoy the conversations a whole lot. That's the big unanticipated benefit from Mike and I doing this podcast. We never thought about that when we we started it. So thank you very much. Well, this is the point in the episode where I ask you, if you haven't already done it, please go and rate the podcast on whatever podcasting app you're listening through. It really helps us become more visible, gain new listeners. And if you listen to us and you have a modeling friend who does not listen to Plastic Model Mojo, we'd appreciate you recommending us to them. Uh, you may have to, if they're a little bit less tech savvy than you are, you may have to walk them through how to get a podcast app and how to listen. That's the biggest way we grow is a recommendation from a friend. So please do that for us. In addition to that, once you're done here, please check out the other podcasts out in the model sphere. You can do that by going to www.modelpodcast.com. That's modelpodcastplural.com. There you can find banner links to the other podcasts who are participating with us in this spirit of cross-promotion. In addition to podcasts, there are a lot of YouTube channels and blogs out there that we follow pretty regularly, and uh, we'd appreciate checking those guys out too. We've got Mr. Chris Wallace at Model Airplane Maker, Jeff Groves, the Inchi Guy at the Inchi Blog, Stephen Lee, Sprue Pie with Frets, and Jim just dropped a new video. Yes, he did. Finally. Jim Bates, Scale Canadian TV, finally got his acting gear there and uh, putting out some new content. And Evan, you too. Panzermeister36 on YouTube. Why don't you give us the, the status on what's going on there and what you got coming up soon? Oh, well, I just uploaded my entirely serious April Fool's Day video, which was quite well received and always working on a bunch of builds and weathering projects there as well as the occasional model railroad thing but of course my passion is weathering 135th scale armor well evan uh i want you to know that after watching that video i went out immediately and ordered a set of brass toothpicks my <laughs> own my only concern is that they might not be hard enough i think titanium might have been a better alloy but uh we'll see where that goes I'm waiting for the AK Interactive depleted uranium toothpaste. There you go. <laughs> the only problem with them, you need to get a crane to pick them up with. <laughs> yeah, don't pick your teeth with those ones. Exactly. Finally, this is the point in the episode where uh, I ask you, if you're not a member of IPMS USA, IPMS Canada, IPMS Norway, IPMS Israel, IPMS Australia, whatever country you live in, if you're not a member of your national organization, 
please reach out to them and and look them up. You know, simple Google search will find them for you. And if your country has a national IPMS organization, please consider joining. The national organizations coordinate a lot with each other. They also do a lot to help local chapters form and coordinate contests and things like that. So it's well worth the minuscule amount of money in the scheme of things you'll pay to join your national organization. Well, if that's it, Dave, let's have a word from our sponsor. Plastic Model Mojo is now brought to you by Model Paint Solutions, your source for harder steam back airbrushes, David Union power tools, and laboratory-grade mixing, measuring, and storage tools for use with all your model paints, be they acrylic, enamels, or lacquers. Check them out at www.modelpaintsolutions.com. Come and make it in Texas, guys. After Heritage Con, man, I am fired up. I cannot wait. I can't wait either. Well, you don't have to wait long because at the time of this recording, it is 122 days until the IPMS National Convention in Sa- San Marcos, Texas. We're going to be under 100 soon. Yeah, about four months. Yeah. By yeah. the end of the month, less than the end of the month. Man, Three I weeks. Gotta, I got to start day. scraping my pennies together and getting ready. Well, I don't have a lot of updates this week, but, uh, you know, we got some big plans we're trying to get together. Yep. The youngest person here has the crazy idea of flying down to Louisville and riding with us for. <laughs> Two thirds of a day. He's insane, but you gotta love him. I guess so. Keep having him back. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Sounds like fun. It, yeah, yeah, I'm sure it will be a nonstop talk fest. We're all going to show up in San Marcos, and none of us is going to have a voice left. Yeah, I'd rather fly in a plane and just look out the window or go a nice long road trip. Yeah. There you go. See, that's the that's the thing. You're young. You got that energy. You can survive it. 15 and a half hours may kill Mike and I. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's we'll have, have some tag team driving this time. Yes, that's right. But to get a, a comfy vehicle, too. There you go. Well, the Ultima was not bad. I don't know if it was 15 hours, not bad. <laughs> yeah, okay. True enough. I could be. I don't know. A little a, a minivan would be pretty killer, though. Yeah. Yeah. Because whoever's in the back can just kick back and chill yep. and lay across and sleep. <laughs> we're gonna need it's to do me. We're gonna need to do some of that. <laughs> well, folks, if you haven't made plans yet, there's still rooms in the vicinity. It's gonna be a grand time. So that's it. Get your reservations made and uh, make plans to be in San Marcos in uh, the first week of August of this summer. It's gonna be hot. It's gonna be cool. Yes, all it at is. the same time. <laughs> Cannot wait. <laughs> Well, it's time for the Benchtop Halftime Report, brought to you by our good friend Ed Tackett at TackettZ.com. Tackett Z for the must-have tools for the model maker. You can visit Ed's operation at www.tackettz.com. He's doing a lot of 3D printed accessories for your workbench. He's got some acrylic paint cleaner for your airbrush. Yep. Uh, who knows what he might come up with next. Evan, you go first. Man, what is on your bench? Too many things and maybe even more soon. Currently, I've got a few projects on the go. I've got my, my Panzer III, which I'm doing as an Africa Core vehicle. Lots of stowage on there, which is a new thing for me because I suck at painting wood and tarps. So I'm learning some here. And I've also got a Panzer IV that's on hold because I'm waiting for some decals to come from Ukraine. And I understand that when they shipped them out, they said this might take a long time to arrive. And I said, I understand why. Yeah, that's right. And I also have a Jagdpanzer IV and an SDK of said 250 that I am working on for my buddy build with Hamilcar Barkas. A fellow YouTube modeler, we're both building SDK of said 250s and Jagdpanzer IVs. And they're uh, both cool vehicles, so I'm having some fun here. And there's going to be a diorama involved as well. Which 250 are you building? I've got the Slash 9 which, Noi. Which is? Uh, that's the one with the SDK of said 222 style turret on oh, the top, okay. right? Right. I love that turret on the any vehicle uh, with that turret. I love it. It's such a sleek looking thing. And I might even start something new because I, I bought that Tamiya KV2. We can talk about that in the broken wallet section. But <laughs> in Heritage Con, I got a KV2 that I've already collected some aftermarket for. And, and you printed me some little fuel tanks for it, Mike. So I might crack that open as well. Now, that being a Tamiya kit, that should be a pretty easy build. And I already picked inside the box and it looks pretty slick. So... 
I might be a, a JB style slammer build though with my aftermarket pile for it. I don't know how well that'll <laughs> that'll come to fruition. <laughs> but yeah, I'm I'm just amped up after Heritage Con trying to work on five things at once here, but that's my style, I guess. Is that all you got? Well, that's, yeah. <laughs> what do you mean that's what all else, I got? <laughs> what, do you, what else do you want? I had to say it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's it. That's that's plenty. Uh, I hope I don't see your 250 build anytime soon because there's a there's a rabbit hole there for me to go down to. Yeah. <laughs> there's, one of those, there's a couple of those I want to do. One of them well, was a mortar carrier, but when it was destroyed in Berlin, it wasn't a mortar carrier anymore. And then I like the I like the little stumble version of that gun of that vehicle too. Yep. On the Noya, on the new the new version. Well, Dave, other than fixing broken crap, what are you doing? Yeah. Well, mostly fixing broken crap. Uh, three of my models were uh, damaged in transit. Uh, Is that including the latent Musaru build? Including the latent Musaru build, the uh, I have started the while again like you. Got home from Heritage Con on Monday and really didn't even recover energy until probably last night. So I've started repairing the models and I feel like I got to get them repaired. I've got to make myself repair them. If I don't, then what will happen is they'll just get shoved someplace and never get repaired. So I'm repairing them, but that has not kept me from starting a new model, the F Academy F8E, because since I was the person who suggested the theme for the Model Geeks uh, National Group Build, which was Navy MIG Killers, or Navy and Marine Corps MIG Killers, I have to get a model done for that, and I love the F8, uh, the last true gunfighter. I've started it. I told myself I was going to build it out of the box other than the decals. I've got aftermarket decals for it, but I will admit that I went online and, and picked up a resin injection seat and some photo etch and those are all on their way. And uh, I don't know how much I'll use, but we'll see. And then in the meantime, I've got still got to finish the B-52 and I have to put the antenna and antenna wire on the cake. Uh, so I can have those because I want to have a lot of stuff to actually take down to San Marcos. Yeah, my, I've got a busy bench, and the problem is I've also got a messy bench. So with the wife and children out of the house, one of my goals is to do a major uh, declutter on the model bench, get it better organized, and and so that. I can build faster because one of the things that I am dedicating 2023 to is not only build better, but build faster and see if building faster leads to building better. So, and I also have that kilometer marker that you 3D printed and painted up. Uh, I got one from you uh, at Heritage Con and just for giggles, I painted it uh, or I've painted almost completely painted it and I'm just going to do one and then I'm going to find a place to work it into some sort of diorama or base at some point. So how about you, Mike? Well, as you both know, I was trying to finish the pin wash on the E16 catapult. Just inching my way through that, that literally. I, I work on it about three inches at a time, and I just get sick of it. Um, I, there's just a lot of rivets, Dave. There's a lot of angle iron and rivets and, and lots of places for wash. And I'm using a MIG ammo black wash over the yep. gray, and it's. I just have such a love-hate relationship with that stuff because – I don't know if it's the, the painted surface finish or the wash or what, but uh, that that stuff just sometimes it works great. Sometimes it just wants to tie it out and leave stupid rings around everything. That's why you've got to have a, a little bit of thinner and a brush. Well, I know, but I, I, I don't have a good thinner to thin it with. Every thinner I've tried makes the problem worse. Mm. So I'll, I'll persevere. I got one side done. The other side's about a third done. And uh if, if I take my time and work slow and correct as I go, I can get it done. But it's it just shouldn't, shouldn't be that hard. Well, you haven't even put any rust streaking or anything on it yet, right? No, no. That's all the secondary weathering, but we'll get okay. there. 
That's that'll that'll be a lot easier than than just trying to get this stupid pin wash done. I hope. Other than that, I've just been sizing up a bunch of other projects. I think I might start, and you know, I got the KV eighty five kind of waiting in the wing, and I've, I've you know I've started it. It's pretty far along, and yeah, I, I need to finish the tracks for that thing so I can pose the suspension. It's the same old stuff I keep talking about every other week, man. <laughs> Remember, part of the reason we started this podcast was to hold ourselves accountable to getting stuff done. I know. And I'm, I've gotten more done since we started the podcast than I've ever gotten done. I know. It just might not be enough for uh, marketability of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, then, then join me in the, in the 2023 year of building faster. Maybe. I like my products too much to, to want to rush through them, though. I, I hear you, man. There's that's nothing. There's nothing better when you're working on a project and you really, really like the project. Well, maybe, maybe in two weeks we'll have the catapult done. Good, Evan. I mean, I'm a lot like Mike. I really, really like all the projects I'm working on, even if there's ten of them at once. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Gentlemen, I assume. Well, I, I don't assume. I know for a fact because I witnessed some of it. Money has been spent late, lately in the hobby. Let's start with Evan. Evan, what's broken your wallet lately as if I didn't know because I came upon you with an armload of kits at Heritage Con? Well, Heritage Con is the end of the month. Uh, March was a... Maybe a bit of a spending month for me. I put in an order from uh, the Super Hobby Store in Poland, which is an excellent online retailer. Yes. Um, and their shipping is very reasonable to Canada. So that's a, a good option for my Canadian friends out there. Super-hobby.com. I put an order in for there for some aftermarket bits, especially these master uh, 3D printed and brass uh, antennas for Panzer III and such. They look excellent. They just arrived. I also got some figures because uh, my fellow YouTuber, Hamilcar Barkas, always puts nice figures in little bases with his builds. So I decided to grab some some figures, like at least one for each of my upcoming builds, which will allow me to practice painting figures and uh, make my models look a little bit more lively. So I know, I know a lot of armor modelers like to have at least one figure with every armor model when they put it on the yeah. base, not necessarily for purposes of telling a story vignette diorama, but simply providing scale. Yes, absolutely. And especially if it's a very large vehicle or a very small vehicle that can really yes. emphasize the, the clunky nature of it. Yeah. So I'm trying to, to flex that muscle and make the models look a little bit more lived in. And also I haven't painted figures in a while, so I need to, I need to practice that as well. So I also put another order from Blast Model Resin Accessories from France, and they make excellent stuff. So I blew another 100 bucks or so there on a bunch of <laughs> bits and bobs for various projects. And then Heritage Con was the double tap on my wall at the end of the month. <laughs> it, was already, it was already dead, but we just confirmed the kill. <laughs> I think I bought five dragon kits there. Or I think I bought four dragon kits and the Tamiya KV2, but they were all... Very reasonably priced. And you saw me, yeah, with, with my stack of three dragon kits that I purchased about 30 seconds into the to the show. <laughs> I went straight for Ed Kubiak's excellent collection of dragon kits. And then also the barrel store got some of my money because they always have a bunch of good resin and photo etch and accessories and so I'm on. I'm telling you what, that's something we really didn't mention. But the, it's a vendor that, at the Heritage Con called the Barrel Store. They obviously specialize in armor detail and upgrade and and all. Man, I, I what do you have? Ten tables? Yeah, it was like maybe twenty percent of Heritage Con's vendor space was his collection of decals, photo etch, three D printed resin figures, everything, all the brands. I haven't seen anything like that short of a full-blown U.S. Nationals, where you have some, one vendor who comes in and has everything for a certain market. It reminded me very much of the of the uh, CMK special hobby tables at the at the U.S. Nationals. Yeah, lots of stuff. Yeah, 
You had to know what you wanted if you went to that table, man. That's right. <laughs> you could you could kill the entire contest sitting there going through Tupperware container by Tupperware container. So, so Mike, uh, have you broken your wallet? Not as bad as Evan. Well, you know, nobody's done that. He must have got a bonus. Yeah, really, man. <laughs> I, I, I stumbled upon Mr. Kubiak's table as well, and I came away with a, a Ryfield KV-1, which I was glad to get because uh, uh, Sprue Brothers had one of their lightning deals a couple months back, and they had that th- sucker on there, and I had all intent to buy the thing and just, just forgot to do it. Just got preoccupied with something else and forgot. Well, I, I got it for about the same price, so that worked out well. And you got to pay in Monopoly money. You have to stop this, Dave. They're not going to let us back up there. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Evan will smuggle us over the border in the trunk of his car. He's got a little car. <laughs> and in addition to the kit, I, I picked up, a, there was a, a copy of uh, one of the Nuts and Bolts books. Yeah. For a good price. I You can't beat those books, man. And it's one I didn't have. And it was one that I, I it was on my list to get if I ever saw it. So. It all worked out. Other than that, I, I guess uh, the only thing that came back from Heritage Con was uh, Bruce Worrell brought brought a brought down a kit that I'd bought. Where where, where was that stash from, Evan? That was just uh, an older gentleman who had uh, I think realized he had too many kits and had gotten rid of them, and they were at the Hobby Center, which is our local hobby store a store here, and that was that was around christmas time i think that was late december yeah so i those I'd, things showed up i'd paid bruce for that a while back and i guess we had planned on him bringing it to, to the national show in the united states but uh then we decided to come up your way and he brought it down and passed that one off to me it's it's a, it's a dragon uh opal maltier and i'm 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 going to use that as hopefully parts to improve a itulary uh, panzer for 42 and uh been playing around with that, and it looks like that's going to be a viable thing to improve the suspension detail on that model. I'm trying to think what else I've bought in the last couple of weeks. That's about it, I think, Dave. Well, uh, I bought a few things. Uh, one, uh, I think I mentioned it on. I think I mentioned it somewhere along the line. The Musaru Cup build. I decided, you know, I've always used Future, and I've got a bottle of the GX100 from Mr. Color. And people rave about it. And, you know, Futures always worked for me, and I was quite happy with it. But, you know, I'm building this Mooseroo, and I'm like, you know, what's the point of building this if you don't stretch your legs, if you don't try new stuff, if you don't experiment? So I got the GX100 out, and I used it to gloss the model before the decals. And I was very impressed by it. It pretty much has all of the same features as as Future, but it dries not only rock hard, it dries almost immediately. So after the success of that experiment, I went out online and ordered uh, not only the GX100, but the 113 and 114, which is their semi-gloss and their flat because I want to try those out. On the way back from Heritage Con, I got online while you were driving, and I ordered an Academy F80 that (laughs) showed up so that I could get that MIG build or MIG killer build started. I also ordered uh, from Edward Photo Etch and masks for that. I got ejector resin ejection seat for it uh, off of eBay. And uh, let's see, is that? Dang, 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 Dave. At Heritage Con, the only thing I bought was some sanding stuff from the Flexophile folks. Hobby Center had a both a Fine Molds F4J and a Vespid uh, Yog, Yog Panther. And in retrospect, I probably should have bought both of those, but I held off. I didn't, and now I regret it a little. But uh, I did get some stuff from the Flexophile folks, so I've been spending a little. I mean, I'm not competing with you all, but uh, I, I've spent a few dollars here and there. That's okay. There's no competition. I won. <laughs> yeah, well. 
Or you, maybe I lost. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. Depends on, you know, you won your bank account lost. <laughs> and you didn't even buy a decal sheet, Dave. No, I did not. I managed to go, although uh, I got a pointer the the last episode, one of the other pleas that I made to the listeners was looking for markings for the Hawaiian Airlines DC-3 that was at Honolulu Airport on uh, Pearl Harbor and was actually shot up a little bit. And Michael Karnak, of all people, pointed me to a company that makes it in 1144 scale. And uh, I've got to reach out to them and see if they do it in 72nd scale or uh, if they might make it available. I spent a little bit of money. Not I'm, I'm not competing with you all, but but I, I spent a little money. Getting the right sized base for your model, diorama, or vignette can be difficult and time consuming. Bases by Bill has the solution with their all new custom sized display bases. Offering sizes of 4 to 30 inches, you choose the dimensions you want and get the size you need every time. And they can laser engrave the base with a unit emblem or text all to your specifications. Better still, shipping is included within the lower U.S. 48 states. Built by modelers for modelers, Bases by Bill has bases and display cases for any type of model and for any size. Visit their website at basesbybill.com to see their products or to get your own custom-built base or display case quote. Use the code MOJO at checkout to apply a 15% listener discount to your order. That code again is MOJO for 15% off. Bases by Bill, for all your model display needs. Well, guys, it's time for another installment of the Wheel of Accidental Wisdom. All right. I'm prepared to face the wheel. (laughs) Bring it on. Well, guys, our listeners have sent in a bunch of topics, and I've taken off what we covered the last time with, with Jim. Jim Bates, Scale Canadian TV, was on here the last time we did this this feature, and I take I've taken all those off. That said, I still have at least twenty five because our listeners have really come through. So yes, they have. Let's get going. Let's get the first spin on on record. Old builds. What to do with them? Evan, you got any old builds? Well, there's only an issue with storage if you actually finish a lot of models, right? <laughs> That's true. I've got a... You're hitting where it hurts. Maybe half of my old builds I keep because either they're quite good or they're a vehicle that was interesting and I like to keep it. Like, for example, my first and second vehicles, I still have those because they're they're a good comparison with how far I've advanced. But a lot of them, I haven't, I haven't thrown any out, I think. Maybe I threw out one, but usually I just kind of tuck them away in a box where I'm probably never going to look at them again. Maybe I could rip parts off them if I need them later, but <laughs> I'm not too sentimental. If I ever get really low in space, I'll, I'll toss some of them. Dave. Uh, well, uh, basically three things. If they're really old and broken, throw them away or scavenge them for parts. Uh, if you're, when I finish a model, I put it in the case. I may take it out to take it to a contest or two. Uh, but ultimately it ends up living in the case. And then if anybody ever expresses interest in a particular model or uh, they particularly like it, I'll occasionally give it away to somebody who who likes the model. Because, you know, unless it's uh, something particularly special for me, once I'm done building it, it's in the case. If somebody gets some enjoyment out of it, that's great. I'm happy to happy to let them have it. How about you, Mike? Well, I'm slow build man, so I, I don't have a lot of issue with this. But I, I remember throwing out throwing out a few uh, of my really early builds. Yeah, it, it, it kind of sucked because they had won some awards early early on. They were, they were junior awards, so that's how old they were. <laughs> One of them was was the, a Katusha BM13 launcher from Italeri. Yeah, which. Uh, I made the mistake that I see. I see it very often. It shows. In fact, I saw it at Heritage Con. There was a there was a an entry that uh, was this 
particular vehicle. That kit is a post-war truck, and everybody builds as a World War II vehicle just because they don't know, right? Right. But, you know, I threw that one away. It, that one may have gotten damaged, but I, I had an SU-122 from Tamiya that had won an award in early show as a junior. They ended up pitching. I've, I've got the trophy still, but uh, the models weren't that great. So away they went. If, if I built more, this could be a big problem, but uh, I don't see that <laughs> same, happening. Same for me. <laughs> <laughs> the most obscure subject from a major manufacturer. Probably the Nazi UFOs, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's pretty good. I'd be hard pressed to argue with that choice, but let's limit it to something that actually existed. Uh, you can for your choice. I, All right. that, that's Evan's answer. That's that's fair enough. Okay. Well, if I'm going to limit it to something that was actually made, it's both obscure and shocking because of I would never think that a major manufacturer would invest the the expense of making a BV-222. Revell, Germany, made the giant German six-engine flying boat that there were only a couple of built. And to see that as an injection kit from a major manufacturer was just, that was the kit that convinced me that we'll eventually see everything ever in <laughs> injection form at one point. Well, for me, and Evan will appreciate this, is that Dragon has been the master at this. I mean, not only have they kitted one-offs, I, I can't remember which which heavy heavy tank unit was, but there's the the Berger Panther with the 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 or is it a yeah, that's what it is, the Berger Panther that they put a Panzer IV turret on. Oh, um, and then, and that's it was this, uh, the same unit. That's, Go ahead. That's was it heavy heavy Panzer Jaeger Abteilung six five three. No, same one that had the Porsche Tiger. I think that's what you were getting at. Yeah, and then was that the unit the same one that had the the T thirty four with the 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 flak filling? Oh, I don't twenty millimeter conversion on it. I don't know enough about the units. I'm more of a technical guy, but yeah, because that that's a one off vehicle, and Dragon did release or Cyber Hobby released a boxing of that. Indeed, yeah, and it, they've gone so far to get punked by a, a Photoshop vehicle. <laughs> yep. And released a kit of what is it? It's a T thirty four with a eighty eight millimeter gun on it. A German yes, that's a Flak thirty six or <laughs> that's a famous photoshopped image you see posted on Facebook once every couple of months, and everyone says, "Yeah, this is photoshopped." Here's the original, and then Dragon came up with a kit. <laughs> so that's pretty obscure, Dave. Yeah, uh, yeah. If you're if you're imitating a Photoshop, yeah, that's pretty damn obscure. <laughs> At least the BV-222 existed. That's true. Well, that and the, the German UFOs, we all know they existed. Yeah, they're at the, they're at the North Pole. <laughs> they're South Pole. South Pole. South. No, they're on the moon. Haven't oh, you seen you, the movie? Maybe that, too. I have not seen the movie. Oh, the movie is awful. <laughs> it's god-awful. Well, let's spin the wheel and move on. What existing mold is currently unavailable, but overdue for re-release? This would have been an easy question to answer a year ago, which would have been the uh, 72nd scale Dauntless by Hasegawa. Uh, but then Flyhawk came out with their Dauntless, and so there's not the same demand. Evan, can you think of any? Oh, I'm at a bit of a loss here now. Uh, I, I hate to stick a knife in you, but I'm not old enough to to have the, you know, the, all these kits are from my childhood or whatever, <laughs> yeah, and they're not, they're, they're not reboxed yet or whatever, you know. Right. Well, and a there... lot of the dra the dragon kits that are rare that I'm looking for, they're being re released now, right, for three times the price. But yeah, well, yeah. is there one yeah. you're hoping for that hasn't showed up yet? Oh, I don't know. I mean, they re-released the initial, but I managed to get the original boxing of that Heritage Con for a really good price. I have a few Dragon kits that have the sticker saying one-time limited production, and then in the past couple of years, you know, they've been re-released. <laughs> yeah, mail that back to them. Yeah, right. 
I don't really have an answer here. Sorry, guys. Mike, you know, it's kind of a this this question is assuming some things that I, I think uh, if you're into nostalgia, that it might be relevant. But yeah, uh, they're like like for Dragon, like I just asked Evan. There, there's not many of those kits that either I have them or I'm, I'm just not hot for them to be released because. The, the rate of releases for new things that are coming out are so much better. Yeah. That uh, I may just wait and see uh, see what happens. Yeah. I, I don't think I've got an answer for this one. Well, I do think that, that uh, you, you raise a good point is that the manufacturers are releasing new kits at such a rate. You know, if there's some old mold that you're the, of something that you're wishing for, Hell, the odds are that that uh, the thing is going to be released in new molds before the old molds are are brought out and repopped. But the key is that it will only be released once you've given up yes. and started to spend a hundred hours improving that old terrible kit. Yep. And when you're almost done, that's when the new kit comes out. Yes, that's what's called throwing yourself on the model for the benefit <laughs> of your fellow modelers. <laughs> Things you save to stretch your modeling dollar. Okay. I can... <laughs> well, you can buy brass toothpicks and they last forever instead of a single use wooden toothpick. <laughs> I knew he was, I knew he was going there. Um, actually, when I go to like Jimmy John's or the other fast food places, you know, the little plastic cups, sauce that, cups, sauce cups. Yep. I always end up, grabbing five or six of those and i use those a lot in from everything from holding small parts to putting water in or or you know mixing acrylic paint in there's a bunch of stuff i use those for so so you're the guy that makes me have to use a a cup lid for my ketchup (laughs) that's it (laughs) that's me i i do the exact same thing there's a I went to a local place here, which is a, a restaurant supply store, and they sell like a 500 pack of takeout cup sauce things plus the lids, and it's like five bucks, right? It's dirt cheap, and and that is amazing because, yeah, like you said, you can store paints in there, parts, the little lids go on, and I know you get them for free. I was going to say, I get them cheaper for free. <laughs> I go buy a sandwich, I get a sandwich, and I get six of those cups. Buy a sandwich is $13. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you and Stu Cox. He held that against me when I told people that's what I did. I've got a big old soda crate. I got a plastic, I think it's a, a crate for two liter soda bottles. Yeah. And it's full of uh, frozen food trays and take out cups and all that kind of jazz tons of it. Yeah. And when I'm doing like groundwork for a diorama and I need something to hold a bunch of messy crap in or whatever, I just reach up there and see what I got and grab something. So that's what I do. Yeah. There's a lot of that stuff you can repurpose if you keep your eye out. So, you know, and I save it all. In fact, I've got a, I got a bag, a shopping bag, over in the corner of the shop here that's full of uh, milk jug lids and orange juice bottle lids Yep, that I, that I saved over the years. And I need to start saving them again because I, I had so many, I quit doing it. Now I'm starting to run thin. And, and probably the, the most obscure one I've got along those lines is, uh, and this is just by happenstance, it was when I was living in apartments, somebody threw out in the dumpster an entire Formica sample chip set. Yes. Yep. And that thing was, it's on one of those beaded, like, you know, like a, a ceiling fan pull chain. Yep. Those beaded chains. That thing must have had a thousand one inch by an inch and a half sample plaques on it. Yep. And I'm still using those things. Do you know what I do? I go over to Lowe's and they have racks of them for free. And I'll take, every time I'm at Lowe's, I'll go by that uh, area and I'll pick up a half dozen or a dozen of those. Those are great for mixing two-part epoxy or putting super glue down or or mixing some sort of putty. Uh, yeah, I, I absolutely love those things. 
Man, you're an entitled brat. Yeah, was, here's a kleptomaniac Golly. here just taking everything. <laughs> they they are there for the taking for free. For people who want to remodel their bathroom. I, I am a customer of Lowe's, and when I'm there, I'm making a purchase. Yes, I'm entitled to take some of them. <laughs> oh, man. Biggest diorama mistakes you see at contests. Oh, uh, easy. Here we go. Mike, you first. <laughs> Sidewater. Uh, yep. I will argue that sidewater done correctly is actually a viable a viable display alternative. But I will agree with you that there's a lot of sidewater that's pointless or needless or worse yet, unfinished. So I will concede to Dave because there was a diorama at Heritage Con that that met the one in one thousand incident rating. The Arizona, yes, the yes. Arizona Memorial, where it showed the the sunken Arizona and the and the pilings that the museum was attached to, or the you know the view the viewing station was attached to. Right, that was kind of cool. Whole point of it is you wanted to see through the side of the water to see the Arizona. Uh, in its in its current state, but for for every one of those, <laughs> there's a thousand five hundred and seventy eight <laughs> where you can see the gravel and crap on the riverbed, and it, it adds absolutely zero to the diorama and actually distracts from it. In my opinion, <laughs> that's the biggest diorama mistake I see at contests. You should clarify that Mike's. Mike's issue here is when you have the you can see the cross section of the water essentially, but then the the landscape is simply painted black along the edges. Yes, right. it should yes. be it should be all painted black along the edge, or it should be you should you can see the side of the water, then also see the side of the earth, and only that that case if it's part of the story. Otherwise, it's distracting. And Mike is correct, and Dave <laughs> is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're just sucking up so you'll get to come back. Um, <laughs> I've got a different answer. Too big. Oh, yeah. Most dioramas that are at contests, the base is too big. Dead, dead space? Yes. Yeah. Everybody needs to go back and read Shep Payne's book on, on dioramas because it's that... And the people who put things perpendicular to the base edge or parallel yes. to the base edge, don't do that. It violates Shep Payne's rules, and he's right. Yeah, you had a good discussion with uh, Ed Barathon last time about you know, him talking about this all with respect to his uh, his P forty eight project, right? Yes, where it, yes. people will tell it P forty seven. Where people were telling him yeah. to cut off the to cut off the wing and to 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 wedge it and you know you shrink the the size of what he was doing. I, I would agree with you along the uh, the common area you see is making everything nice and square with the edges of the base. One yeah. thing that I find also greatly contributes to adding a little bit of interest is adding some slight degree of slope to the scene, either slight uphill road, slight downhill road, or maybe if it's a grassy plain, you know, give it a bit of a slope one way or the other. That can help contribute to a little bit of interest. Flat ground is rarely flat. Exactly. You don't like the parking lot diorams? <laughs> <laughs> Let's spin the wheel. Lost part stories, recovery or no? I usually find the lost part right after I've completed the model. Yes, and, and had to scratch build to raid another kid. In fact, it happened on the the Musaru, uh, the back plate for the uh, the cockpit for the seat back. Painted it up, had it on the had it on the modeling table. I looked down one day; it was gone. Luckily, I happened to have another Arma P fifty one, so I raided it, got the part I needed painted it up, used it, replaced it. And then I was crawling around on the floor of my model room and found the original part. So you're heading your I, second build because it's already painted. Yeah, exactly. In fact, it's in the box <laughs> with the, the other stuff for that. Evan? 
Uh, I've lost a few parts here and there. I think the the most extreme case I've had is on my my T forty. I lost one of the suspension bump stops, which is quite a an obvious piece of the suspension looking along the side of the vehicle, given how gangly that vehicle's suspension is. And so I did scratch build. I think that was the first time I scratch build anything. I, I kind of hobbled or cobbled together something that looked all right, and then I, you know, covered it with mud and snow. <laughs> uh, I haven't had terrible. Uh, I'm usually pretty good at, at contorting myself and getting down there and digging around and finding it. I, I know what one of the guys, my local club here, uh, Kevin. I think his story is he lost a road wheel for one of his tanks at one point. How do you lose a road wheel? How far did that thing roll? <laughs> he says he's never found it. Yeah. Well, for me, it's I, I'm I think I'm beyond this. Like on the E16, I lost one of the uh, the exhaust flares for the for the cowling, and I just went out and got another kit. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't just cat up and print a new one. You can probably well, do that I, faster I, than you can. This is before get down I had, on your floor. Before I had all that stuff, so I, ah, right. I I got a I got a new kit and I took the part and I made a little squash mold and some uh, plaster of Paris, and uh, squash mold a new replacement for it and then put the put the original back in the box. Uh Yes, I guess I did lose a part, and I did recover. Yep. And from now on, you'll just 3D print them. Maybe. Depends on how hard it is to draw. (laughs) Subject you enjoy seeing, but have zero interest in building. Uh, For me, that would probably be modern jet aircraft. I love looking at those at shows. Especially Heritage Con, you go through the especially 30 second scale, like a 30 second scale Phantom or F-15 is a beast. That's a huge kit and they look amazing. And I would never want to do one of those. (laughs) I am interested in aircraft from my education and such, but I don't know if they're quite my cup of tea. And if I do, I'm going to do Japanese World War II stuff because that's fun to weather. I'm sure Dave will. Dave will support me there until I say that I want to do 48 scale, not 72. Well, but. It, uh, listen, you, you can start in the sinful scale and work your way down. It's okay. <laughs> you know, we're, 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 we're we, we, we support all. So uh, for me, okay. And, and with, with uh, Wonderfest coming up, this is appropriate. Non-historical figures and busts, uh, you know, uh, some of the horror stuff, some of the sci-fi figures. Um, I love to look at them. I love to admire the work, and some of them are so well done. But if if I'm doing figures, I'm probably doing historical figures. Uh, those are probably also out for me, too, just because of my uh, essential tremor. But... If I ever do figures, it's probably not going to be sci-fi, horror, you know, that sort of stuff. But I love going to particularly Wonderfest and and looking at them all because there's some really, really great work and some really inventive techniques that get featured in those type those types of figures. So that'd be it for me. Well, for me, it's uh, the 700 scale ships. Now, one that comes to mind is one that Tim Nelson built. And where did we see that, Dave? Was that in Las Vegas? Yeah, it that was. was the, that was in Las Vegas. It was the USS Washington. That's that's some small stuff. Yes. And some small photo etch and, and other stuff. I don't know. Rigging and I don't know how he's doing it. Wire, stretch, stretch brew, whatever. No, train spider. Train spider? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Some of them have crews on them. Oh, yeah. They make 700 scale photo etch figures. So uh, I love seeing that stuff, especially with, you know, their water line. They're on a good, a good water base without yep. side water. Yep. And <laughs> outside water. <laughs> and it's amazing that you can get something that small and have it look so real. Yep. It's pretty no, I agree with you. Those guys are, are wizards. I'd never do that. I just because yeah. I know what I, I would know what I would want to do with it, and the learning curve to get there would just be a whole new modeling adventure. It'd be like, oh yeah, I would end over, up with right? tangled pieces of photo edge balled up, and you know, at some point, I would launch the model toward the wall, and that would be it. Oh man, let's keep moving.
What should be done differently at shows? Oh, man. <laughs> oh, I've, I've got my number one. Put the first, second, and third awards out on the tables next to the winning models and only announce the best ofs and the specialties and the best to show. And we don't need to sit there for an hour and a half and listen to the announcement of every single award. This goes for the Nationals. This is my only criticism of Heritage Con. It was very slight considering how great the rest of the show was. And invitational shows do this too. You can save modelers a solid hour. And if you do that, you'll draw from further away because people will know I'm going to get out of the show at a decent time and still be able to make it back. We've done this at Louisville for, for many years now. And it helps us draw modelers from far enough away that I'm not sure we would otherwise draw them. Places like Chicago, uh, you know, that's a solid five and a half, six hours. And those guys know that they're going to be done at the contest by 3.30, 3.45 at the latest. And, and they'll still be able to drive and get back in time. So... My number one suggestion for change is put out the first, seconds, and thirds. Now, I would agree with you with one caveat. I would like there to be some time, because I'm, I'm worried that if you, you put the first, second, and third out, everyone's just going to take their models and go yes. home right then and there. I yep. want to be able to to peruse and and see the models and see which ones won. Because you know, some, when the awards ceremony, you're sitting there for an hour, and they say, you know, whoever won for their vehicle x and you think oh yeah i saw that one that looked good but there's a lot where you think mm -hmm. you know I, I don't remember that but it would be nice to be able to to see it in person with the award next to it yes oh uh, well although uh you know if you're sitting there listening to the awards and they announce so and so won first place for his panther you know the odds are that you don't <laughs> know which of the six panthers they're talking about i ag agreed <laughs> So what else? What for? What would you want to change? Me personally, oh, I, I don't know. I, I haven't been doing enough shows to to sense the patterns and how they could be improved. I, I like your idea, though. I would like to see to see the model that won. The, the other way to do that is, of course, to have a slideshow. But then you got to exactly. take pictures of all the models, and that's that's yeah. a lot of effort. That only works for a, a bigger and, show like right like the Nationals. Maybe. Yeah, I'm not sure you could pull that off at Heritage Con where they were announcing the winners while they were still judging other categories. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Dave. I, 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 I've seen the merit of putting the things on the table before and only announcing the, the, the best of's and the, and the higher stuff. And yeah, I guess the, the thing is people take their stuff and dash. Yeah. Be the downside of that. Yep. And while I would, I would argue that, while getting out of there at an earlier time is great for the, the long distance travelers. The the flip side of that is you got folks driving the more modest, modest distances. Uh, now their, their show duration is truncated. Yeah. And I don't know, maybe that's a trade off. Maybe it's not. So I don't know. So uh, what's it? Do you have a different suggestion? Not for that, no. I'm, I'm no. I'm I mean, kind of, for for what would you like to see at shows that you don't see currently? I, I would really like to see more more demos and stuff done at at lower lower attended shows, lower you know invitational right. Invi invitational. Yeah, and because they used even. to do that. Yeah, and you know, especially I, th I think if you if you especially the shows you know at Heritage Con wasn't this way because they really had no way to do it, but. Typically, at least in our region, uh, when the judging starts, yeah, the 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 attendees are not allowed in the, in the model room. Right, they close off. They've got the models in a separate room, and they can physically close them off. So, if that's the paradigm, then other than other than shopping the vendors, you're just sitting around twiddling your thumbs. Right, it's a great opportunity to have other stuff going on. Yep. No, I agree. That's a, that's a good suggestion. And I'll tell you a corollary is I would love to see, with the prevalence of food trucks now, I would love to see more and more shows bring food trucks in 
Uh, I mean, Heritage Con, if, if <laughs> of course, their parking lot was completely full, but I'm sure that there was some way they could wedge three or four food trucks in. Man, with 2,600 people in one place, you know, I, 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 it would, be, it would have been such a great opportunity to bring in, you know, a half dozen various food trucks and give folks a chance to eat on site other than the cafeteria at, or the, the food service place at the museum. Well, up there, that works until the day it's, it's snowing sideways. At yes, I, Con, I understand. Right? I, well, they, <laughs> Heritage Con needs to move a month later. So, Last year, it was indeed snowing sideways as I brought my models in. Yeah. So yeah. It, all, it, there are a lot of Canadians making that point, too, while we are up there. Yeah. No, no. I, I would love to see Heritage Con move 30 days later so that it's the last week in April instead of the last week in March. Is that far enough, Evan? Uh, yeah. No, usually usually by mid-April, it's no longer snow on the ground up here. So, <laughs> All right. We got time for a couple more, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's the sound of lag. I was going to say, the wheel, the wheel has problems. We get this one a lot. What do you listen to while modeling? Evan, you want to take that first? I listen to podcasts. Uh the main modeling podcast here, of course, and mainly YouTube videos, uh, which isn't exactly the best idea because sometimes I find myself yeah. watching <laughs> instead yeah. of listening. Yeah. Um, but there's some uh, there's some YouTube channels out there that are like maybe I listen to a Forgotten Weapons video again for the hundredth time, uh, or some kind of history video. Uh, it's something that's not super interesting and that I have to keep watching. I can just more listen to it. And then that can kind of be something in the background. But if I start listening to a modeling video, then I'm going to start looking at what their technique demo is all about and everything. Yeah. Uh, but there's so many YouTube modeling channels that I like to watch that it it's hard to keep up sometimes. So Sure. Yeah. That's mainly what I do. I don't listen to music or anything like that. Well, I actually have multiple answers for this. Uh, number one is podcast. Number two is YouTube videos, although most of what I listen to is aren't modeling ones, but history ones or military history ones, because you can listen to them and still get most of your enjoyment out of them without having to do, or be drawn to away. Like Drakina Fell, uh, the, yeah. the naval historiographer, uh, I'll, I'll listen to his stuff while while I'm modeling because I'm not necessarily pulled away to, to watch uh, the video. Um, number three uh, is old sitcoms, particularly ones I have see, seen a lot and enjoy. The old sitcom Wings, I've seen every one of those episodes 20, 50 times. So I can put one on my DVD player and turn it on and listen to it, and I've seen it enough that I don't have and I'm not tempted to look up. Uh, in fact, when I was doing the Musaru build, I've been uh, uh, playing the old Barney Miller sitcom, which I really enjoy and is really good. Uh, makes you realize how far TV has fallen from, from what it was. Um, but I don't necessarily have to watch them. And then finally... Uh, I will occasionally listen to music, um, almost always uh, big band or occasionally classical, um, very rarely rock and roll. I do listen to some R&B. Um, most rock and roll is just, it's it's a, a little too frenetic for me to model to, but that's that's basically what I do. Mike? I listen to the modeling podcast primarily. I don't listen to a lot of podcasts outside of that other than uh, there's a career podcast I listen to sometimes. And uh, in addition to that, I do listen to music. I listen to a lot of soft jazz kind of stuff and yep. a big, big band as well. And then I'm, I'm always listening to my 80s, late 70s and 80s new wave stuff. 
that's just the music I when I was a kid I was listening to, so I still listen to that a lot. Now there's one more thing which I think all three of us can agree on, and it it's always fun to have a, a Skype chat or a video chat while you're at the bench. Yes. And we Although, do that sometimes here with the locals, and I do that with some of my YouTube buddies on the weekend. I, I personally, I find to be I find myself to be very productive when that's happening, especially if I'm doing something like sanding row wheels, a repetitive task. Being able to just kind of talk BS with some buddies while that happens makes it a lot more enjoyable. If you're if you're airbrushing, it, it's not as good. <laughs> I was going to say, I completely agree with you, Evan. Uh, particularly if you are doing building and sanding tasks. Now, if you're doing detail work or painting, yeah, it's it's not as good because you keep having to step away or whatever. But yeah, we all look at you, you, me, Mike, Jim, Ian, and Chris will get together sometimes on a Friday or Saturday night. And I am surprised many times how productive those sessions are. Because I feel like I spend most of my time talking with my friends, but when it's over, I'll look down and I'll have accomplished more than I realized I was accomplishing while I was doing all that other stuff. I think it cuts down on the negative modeling. You don't start scrolling through your phone or yeah. scrolling through an online internet. retailer. Yeah. <laughs> yep. A little more. Shit, for an hour here. What's your favorite, least favorite part of the build or both? God, that has changed over time. Yep. I I am now, uh, for me, construction and sanding used to be my least favorite. Now I think it's probably my favorite. Uh, painting and decaling used to be my favorite. And now it's not. I wouldn't say it's my least favorite, but it's not my favorite anymore. Um it's changed over time. I, I, I find sanding and construction a whole lot more relaxing now. And, and I see the benefit of that part of the build. Whereas when I was younger, I was just rushing to get the dang thing together so that I could get to the painting and decaling part, which was the fun part for me. So I think that's age. I don't know. I'm I'm pretty similar there. Uh, I used to not really enjoy the build. I used to try to get through that as quick as I could to get to the painting and weathering. Um, nowadays, I actually quite enjoy the build. Um, maybe now that I'm more, this is almost like AMS kicking in, but I get kind of rivet county with my own build sometimes, but I, I almost enjoy that. It's almost like a puzzle solving the mystery, looking at the historical photos and making the little corrections here and there up in the detail where it matters. I, I enjoy that even though it, it takes me three times as long to build if I if I just instead bought the Tamiya kit or something. Mike, Mike, uh, does that sound like the voice in your head talking back to you? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I thought yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> I I like I like the, the research and the solving the problems the, the kit has that are that are shortcomings based on the research. And you find these little things that you want to fix and you fix them and you, you just, my problem is I'm kind of tend to be a serial builder when it comes to those. I'm a, a problem at one point in a, in a build till I find a solution for that. And, and finding that solution means I'm like sitting up at night, sometimes staring at the ceiling, thinking about it and something will come to me and I'll be able to go to sleep at that point. But uh, <laughs> if, if say for instance, that part of the, problem is in the suspension that will keep me from even moving on to the turret that's 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 where my problem is uh, it, it, which is uh, which is weird you would think you would move on to the turret while you're solving the the suspension problem in your head it's completely a serial process for me and that's I, that's i can usually move on to something else but i i share the engineer mindset of of it haunting me at night. Sometimes you wake up from the you wake up from a dream or something, and you and you've solved it. <laughs> have have you have you ever built models in your dreams? No, neither have I. I but I wonder why it happened. <laughs> oh, you want to do one more, Mike, or is that it? Let's do one more. Okay. Right. How about a good one? Oh, they're all good. How about? 
How about something good that's unanticipated? Dumb modeling ideas. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I think the, the vein of this one was uh, a possibly a solution to something you were trying to implement or uh, a, a path through a build or diorama or something you thought of that uh, ended up being really, really stupid. I have not done this personally. Yeah, right. But no, I haven't. <laughs> But I understand flour for snow is a really, really bad idea, and so is baking soda. <laughs> it is very hard to get snow looking right. That's something I've been trying to figure out for years. <laughs> well, now these new products from uh, AK and all, they I've got to admit, they look like they they may have solved that problem. I don't know. The, the key with snow is that it's translucent, so it creates yes. a shadow that is blue. But all the modeling products are not translucent, so they make a shadow that is gray or black. And it looks like white mud. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that, that's that's the physics of it. And, and the micro balloons, they might be able to do something, but I'm still trying to figure out how to how to master that. Do you have the Snow and Ice uh, AK book? No, I don't. You need to get it because I'm here to tell you there are there are some awfully real looking things. Take a look at that. Or I'll tell you what, when you come down for the nationals, I'll take that. We'll bring that book and you can spend 15 hour and a half hours <laughs> in the back of the car looking at that. Well, I, I've got one. Okay. And then, then, you know, assuming this, this topic is, is open-ended any, any dumb modeling idea. Yep. So when I was building my my Sig thirty three on on the Panzer three, yep, um, I was putting the wash on the road wheels, and I was just didn't want to wait for it to dry. So I I had all dryer? no I had all my road wheels done. However many they are on a Panzer three, I can't remember. Twelve. All right, twelve. <laughs> Plus a couple of spares, so fourteen probably. <laughs> So I put the wash on them and I took my gooseneck lamp and I, I lowered it down like <laughs> just uh, the shade was almost touching the workbench and they were underneath there. Right. So I come back like I come back an hour later. Incandescent bulb. Oh, yeah, for sure. I, I come back an hour later and lift that sucker up and the road wheels are like 48 scale. <laughs> Interesting. They they shrank. They yeah, they, they they shrank. Yeah. Interesting. It was God. It was like you got to be kidding me. And and I I'd already robbed those wheels from uh, Tamiya, uh, Tamiya uh, <laughs> Sturmgeschütz because they they were so much better than the ones that were in the old Dragon Sig thirty three kit. Yep. So I've 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 got my stash like two or three Tamiya Sturmgeschütz that don't have any road wheel sprues in them. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they're made aftermarket now. Are they well, that or you could just buy the sprue from Tamiya. Yeah, well, that's true too. Evan, you got one. You got you got anything else? You got a dumb modeling <sighs> idea? Are you I've had a few where I've come across a complicated assembly. I've left it all disassembled in a little container to deal with later, and then I finally come up with my uh, plan for assembling it, put it together, and then I, it turns out there was some part that had to go inside there at an awkward angle that I forgot to put in and so i i assembled the whole turret without putting something inside or or assembled the whole gun without putting something that happens a lot i, I always forget this tiny piece in there somewhere i've i've been modeling for a long time now and i am only now coming to the realization that following the instructions in most cases <laughs> is probably a good idea <laughs> I, I I don't do that. I, I flip through the instructions and then I think I don't I don't trust this. I can do this better. Yeah. And I, then I'll, I, I'll do it out. I'll do it all out of order because there's there's I, things I like to put together before other things. And I have burned myself between <laughs> so lost between lost sub sub assemblies or things that now no longer can be put where they're supposed to be put. I the older I get, the more I am at least willing to start with giving the instructions the benefit of the doubt 
that they are correct and in the proper order. Uh, my my issue was I built too many dragon kits, so I can't trust the instructions. Yeah, well, that, yes, you, you show us on the doll where the dragon instructions harmed you. <laughs> 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 well, and, and Dave got burned by trying to get the cockpit and the fuselage already joined together. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, until next time, folks, uh, listeners, send us some more, yeah, more, some more pie slices for the wheel of uh, accidental wisdom. Hopefully, we've had a little accidental wisdom tonight. That there's was lot, fun. There's a lot of anecdotes in there, and uh, hopefully, some folks can glean, glean some uh, useful information and avoid some of our pitfalls from the past and. Uh, Improve their situation. Well, guys, we're about at the end of the episode, and uh, I assume we are all through our modeling fluids at this point, given how much uh, time this has taken. Uh, Evan, Evan, what do you think of your modeling fluid? My Zodiac Omnipolo was... Very nice. It's an IPA, which isn't usually my style. I like a darker beer usually, but this didn't have any of that super hoppy, bitter stuff I don't like. It was very nice. It had a nice citrus flavor that wasn't overpowering. Uh, It was as my boss described it. So, Richard, thank you for the recommendation. I'll pick this up again sometime. This is quite nice. Well, that's good. Mike? If you want to spend a little extra money on a bourbon, it's... it's it's more expensive. I I'm not shocked that 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 you liked the uh, old Forester 1920. Given that uh, we've we've shared a bottle. In fact, was it Vegas or was oh, it? Oh yeah, it's Vegas. Yeah, it was Vegas. We shared a bottle there, and uh, uh, that's that's a uh, that's a good bourbon. So I'm not surprised. The Upper Canada Dark Ale, five percent alcohol by volume. I'll be honest with you, generally dark ales are hit or miss for me. This one is really good. It's uh, it, There's a little bit of a caramel flavor to it that is good. Um, very smooth, and the 5% alcohol by volume, of course, it's, it's light uh, compared to most craft beers. Um, I, I I would I I can imagine particularly I can see this given the cold dark never ending winter that is Canada I can see how this would be a really good beer to to drink on a cold dark night sitting by a fire in Canada so good beer and whoever gave it to us please reach out in the DMs because I want to be able to give you credit. So here we are right toward the end. Uh, Only thing we're left is shout outs. I know I've got shout outs. Uh, Evan, do you have anybody or anything you want to shout out? I might be stealing some of your guys shout outs here, but the crew at heritage con for putting on an excellent show. Absolutely. They, they get a big shout out. That show was excellent. It was the biggest one yet with 1,003 models, and it was a very enjoyable experience. Not only just the show itself, but meeting everybody and especially meeting some of the crew there. And and what I'm amazed by is how smoothly it all ran. I mean, Indeed. There, there is no way a show with 1,003 models and over 2,600 people in the building and all done in, you know, one day yeah there's no way that should have run as smoothly as it did and it ran like that was something that they did all the time with those numbers and i mean it was flat out amazing it 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 just was i'm i'm it, I don't know about Mike, but that immediately has leaped to the top of my i must attend this show every year list well, I'm going to shout out uh, our Ottawa gang who took care of our accommodations and yeah. uh, just hung out with us. You, you too, Evan. It was, it was a lot of fun. We appreciated it. Uh, everybody was just really welcoming. And it it was nice to come up there all that way and not have to really worry about much else once we got there. Yep. Absolutely. 
A big shout out to Chris for arranging the Airbnb. What about you, Dave? What you got? Well, I, I, my shout out here, it's, well, again, a shout out to Heritage Con guys. Way to go. Bravo. That show is now second only to the Nationals for for me getting to it. Um, I want to shout out Darren from Model Geeks. We, we got to hang a little bit here and there at the Nationals. Uh, both Las Vegas and uh, uh, Omaha. But we got to spend a lot of time with Darren uh, and his lovely bride. Um, And, you know, it was really a great time. I want to shout out Chris Siebert for hanging around in the dojo uh, Saturday night and sharing his knowledge with us. Um, But it was really nice to interact with Darren on a a longer term basis, not, you know, five minutes on the floor of the Nationals where we just say hi to each other. Uh, it, it was really good, and I'm glad he made it up. So uh, hopefully he says he's going to drag a couple of the other geeks to Heritage Con next year. So maybe we'll have a supersized dojo uh, uh, next year. And the Mounties will show up. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Not the what, what's the what's the Canadian equivalent of a SWAT team? The RCMP JTF two, maybe I don't know. Okay, <laughs> great. We're going to get a sniper kill from two and a half kilometers away. <laughs> Anything else, guys? Nope, that's it. Well, I'd like to give Chris Sieber Lafram seventy two a, a quick shout out for his excellent seminar for. Weathering aircraft at Heritage Con, it was it was great. I learned a lot, even though I'm a filthy air, uh, armor modeler, not an aircraft modeler. But his discussion about using transparent oils is something that I never ever considered, but it seems like absolute genius. Yeah, because I'm always trying to get my thin transitions of opaque oils, and if I just used a transparent oil, that'd be so much easier. Yeah, and then seeing his models on the table afterwards just drove home how insane. Because those big blown up, the big blown up photos in his presentation, they could have been thirty second scale. Like oh, the size absolutely! Of the, the chips and everything, and then you go look at a seventy second scale aircraft on the table, and you're like, "How do you paint a chip that small?" Exactly. <laughs> the, the, in fact, some of that stuff, the only way you could see it is in a blown up photograph. Yet when you went looked at the seventy second scale model you knew it was there and it was part of what was creating what you saw, but you couldn't even necessarily pick it out because it was on a 72nd scale aircraft. All right, guys, we're at the end. We need to wrap this up. Yep. Evan, thanks for joining us again. Thank you for having me on. And we'll have you back. We'll do this again soon, Evan. Probably not before Nats, but right. I'm sure something will happen in mass like that. Oh, oh yes. <laughs> I can't wait for it, guys. <laughs> you and me both. All right, Dave, as we always say, so many kids.